Hot ends heating, hardware hanging, supportless structures sagging shapes, and rat rig refuses real results. All this and more. Printfix Friday, episode 181. Let's get into it. Starting off, we got a Sovol that the nozzle is loosening when the machine is at temperature. Let's take a look. Okay, so we have a Sovol IDEX printer. Not exactly sure. Maybe that's the SV04? The actual specific printers kind of irrelevant in this one. Before we actually talk about why the issue is occurring, I do want to bring up something that's more of a safety factor. Do not be poking on 3D printers that are currently hot and live with a metal Allen key. I totally understand. I don't want to get burned, so I'm going to touch with something made out of metal. But those heaters can short across that Allen key and can blow your motherboard. So be careful there. We do recommend to use some sort of ceramic or something like that or wrap whatever you're touching it with in capped on tape, minimize any issues with the electricity conductivity. We don't want to have your printer shorting out because you were trying to show something on video. But the issue that we have is this particular hot end here is getting loose as it gets warm. And actually that's correct. It, it, it should be doing that. In fact, you want it to do that. When you change out nozzles or any parts on the hot side of a 3D printer, it needs to be done when it's hot because metal expands when it gets hot. And the aluminum and brass are no exception to that rule. They have a thermal expansion coefficient. And that means when it gets hot, it gets a little loose. So something to do here is one, to make sure that that hot end self is clocked correctly. If we look at the other hot end, it's 180 degrees out of phase with the heater on the back side rather than the front side. So if that is the way it's supposed to go, fine, you're good to go. If not, get everything swapped around because that can obviously lead to some potential problems. But when you're doing a nozzle change or parts on a hot end change, you need to tighten everything down when it is hot. We do a finger tight when it's cold and then go ahead and really cinch it down when it is hot. And that seems to work quite well for us. For these Mark 8 style hot ends, where this is a Mark 8 style versus a V6 style, which looks more like this with the nozzle shaped a little bit differently, you want to go ahead, tighten everything down when it's cold, loosen the nozzle by half a turn, and then turn everything on to the actual heat break. Nothing should really be tight up against the heat block itself. The heat block should just exist. And if you have two things that are threading in contact each other and you tighten those together, it will also lock the heat block in. If you have any amount of gap in there, plastic will work its way up through the threads or down through the threads and end up encasing your hot end in a bit of a plastic glob. And there's no easy way to combat that if you're not paying attention. Over time, machines can loosen up. Even these new high-speed machines, their actual physical hardware can loosen over time. And that is no different for a Let's go with more tame machine when it comes to speed. You need to make sure that your parts are hot tightened and checked relatively often because a nozzle slowly unscrewing itself can be a real problem with a Z offset over time. So how exactly do you solve this? Pretty simple. First off, make sure that heat block is clocked correctly. Then let's go ahead and get that nozzle nice and tight against the heat block, remove it eh, about a turn or two, and then tighten the entire heat block onto the heat break itself. If you can tighten the heat break on its own, do that. So tighten the heat break down onto the nozzle, but sometimes you can't take the heat breaks out of these machines. If you can do that, it's way easier to deal with when it is out of the machine. And if you want to go ahead and remove all the electronics from it, you totally can take out the thermistor, take out the heater, and you can use a blowtorch of sorts to get it nice and warm. Just not until it's glowing red. We, we don't want to see that. But when you do assemble it, Make sure that everything is nice and tight because you don't want that heater wiggling and you definitely don't want that thermistor being loose either. Hope it helps. Speaking of helping, my name is Grant. This is 3D Musketeers and Print Fix Friday where we help you get your printers back to printing with purpose. And if you are going through some challenges with your machines and you want to get some help, you can reach out to us on all the social medias. You can email us or 
our new preferred method where you make a video on YouTube and tag us in it. That way we can see it. It shows up right in our YouTube feed and makes it really simple for us to find you and get you helped out so you can get your printers back to making parts. If you do like this series and you want to support it, you could do so by joining for as little as $1 a month via the links in that description down below. And at the $10 tier and how you get to come hang out in our private Discord server where we've had quite a few new members recently. We're doing more hangouts in there. And hey, if you don't, that's okay too, but we would appreciate a like and a sub if you haven't done that yet. Helps the channel grow. Moving on, we've got this Flash Forge AD5M, which I recently looked at an AD5M that came in for a broken machine. Those machines are proper good. I am very interested to see this AD5X with how good my first impressions were with that AD5M. They're saying issues with my print. Any solutions? New to 3D printing. Heard I might need to move the nozzle up on the Z axis or clean it out, or it may be bed adhesion. Not sure what to do. Let's take a watch. Yep, that one's pretty simple. Oh yeah, real simple. The big thing with 3D printing, think of it like you're making something out of wet spaghetti. Never heard of good spaghetti. And if you can't make that thing out of wet spaghetti in reality, you're not gonna be able to 3D print it out of, well, wet spaghetti plastic. <laughs> You need to support those areas that are overhanging. And quite frankly, I'm going to give the machine a fair bit of credit. That is better than I would expect. Likely there was a bit of a string that got caught at some point and it will eventually recover. The rest of the print looks just fine, but you will need to support those arms. You'll need to put some support material going down to the bed. For prints like this, the organic or tree supports are often the best type to utilize here. They will work with contoured surfaces a lot better than a snug or a grid style support. They also look way cooler in my personal opinion, but they're more designed for this kind of shape where your snug or your grid supports are more designed for flat kind of even surfaces. It's not a big deal. This is one of those things that if you're new to 3D printing, you don't know for sure. And depending on what slicer you're using, it should have warned you about adding those supports. You can just have your slicer add the supports for you, but it's really good to learn how to do the supports yourselves. And if you do want a actual like tips and tricks video about how to do supports for 3D printers, let us know and we'll make one. So yeah, just turn on supports. In my opinion, I'd use organic on this one. The rest of the part looks pretty good. So hey, good job there. You've got some decent settings. You are using grid infill not my favorite. I'm more of an adaptive cubic kind of guy, but we are working on an upcoming series where we're going to be testing infills and printing techniques and temperatures and lots of other things. And a fair bit of it is going to end up being live stream. So if you'd like to see us break things and put me likely in more danger than I probably should be, hey, you know, follow along and get subscribed. If you could give this person one basic tip on support, let me know what that would be in those comments. If you've got any particular tips and tricks, especially if you own an AD5M or the AD5M Pro, would love to see you adding a little bit onto this down in those comments. But often stock settings get you like 90% of the way there minimally. Moving on to a bamboo here that says, how could I have avoided this? We've got a egg of some sort, it appears. Definitely, this is a random seam issue. And to provide a bit more context, they're trying to print this egg for their daughter. When they tried the first time, there were two main problems. At the end, it unglued from the plate and the whole top was a mess. Secondly, there was a visible seam running vertically, which made it look odd. To try to solve this, they added a bigger brim for stability, which is good. That's actually what you want. You know, when in doubt, put a brim on it. Okay, if you like it, then you should put a brim on it. Uh, uh, oh. Uh. Also slow down the printer after starting and change the seams to random. However, as you can see in the photo now, I end up having a very stringy underside and the seam was replaced by very bulky blobs all over the place. This one with the actual blobs from the random seam. That is because the printer is moving during that time. And during that time, the filament is staying a little bit warm inside of that hot end and it's gonna blob a little bit when it comes out. It's somewhat normal and to be expected when you're using the random seams. With the actual bottom of the part itself, that's where support material can help out. But honestly, there's not much you can do to solve this issue. Because this egg is lower poly, you could choose one of the areas where the polygons change that surface a little bit add a cut there and print it so it's more of a dome feature rather than an undercut, right? 
the undercut is difficult to support. And unless you're using a machine that has a tool changer associated with it, even like the AMSs with bamboos will struggle with this. But unless you're using something where you can use dissimilar materials and do it properly, the underside of spheres like this or egg shapes are not going to look good. The reason that the issue with these blobs went away the higher up you went is because the machine was moving less to get to those different areas, right? The longer it is sitting in travel, the longer time it has to build up the actual pressure to then push it out when it starts. You can go ahead and use an X-Acto knife if you want to clean it off, go get a piece of sandpaper and just sand it down. Or something that we've recently found, this Ryobi half-inch belt sander that is really, really good at cleaning up parts. Like you can see how much filament is still on there. It's a very, very good tool, but it does need a bit of dust collection. We're going to be working on that in a upcoming live stream, but we absolutely love this tool. And a huge thank you to David, AKA Prusha guy for showing me how awesome this tool was when we were out in Prague. Remember kids, I don't care if it's power tool, trigger discipline matters. But certainly if you're not looking for an excuse to buy a new tool, which why not? Some sandpaper and some time will take care of this, no problem. As for the underside, you could try doing a material change like PETG supports with a PLA part, but you really got to get your purge volumes right on those bamboos or it ends up being an absolute nightmare to do it right. You could cut the egg in another way. We just try to say if you're going to be adding a seam in there with a cut line, do it in a place that's a little bit inconspicuous. That way you don't have too many issues. You could certainly do it on the underside of the egg, you know, maybe at that level or even the level below it to where the seam is much lower on the egg itself. And again, a little bit of sandpaper goes a long way into hiding a lot of those issues. So as far as what else you could do, you could try reducing that support gap, but you're really playing with fire on that one because it doesn't take too much until those supports are just functionally welded to the part and they'll never come apart. And we don't want that to happen. Last but not least from our Patreon Discord, Mr. Man of the Sky over here with his Rat Rig V Core 3, which I think we have to make a Rat Rig Masochist tag in the Discord because it appears that most people that have Rat Rigs that we talk to outside of like gurus in 3d printing have real issues with the documentation on rat rigs i'd like to know if you have built a rat rigger or looking at building a rat rig and have looked at the documentation and if there's any feedback that you could give on it i want to build one of these new rat rig v core fours but literally everybody that owns one in our server right now is telling me do not do it. Grant, you are not at the skill level that you need to be to do this. It is a monumental pain in the butt. But Man of the Skies printer here, he's finally getting it up and running. And it's definitely been a while. I don't know how long it's been, but I think it's been over a year that he's been working on this particular machine. We've got a blob of doom, but this one's a little bit unique in that it has barely caught that thermistor wire and that thermistor wire is saying please take me out of my misery right now the best thing to do here is to grab yourself a pair of flush cutters and be very careful and try to cut the plastic around those wires if you can get the plastic off of the hot end it's gonna just put all of that weight onto the wires themselves the hot end can handle it those wires are really delicate and have a much higher chance of failure. So try to protect those wires when and where you can. Thankfully, thermistors are relatively cheap. So if you need to get a new one, that's not too bad. But we never do like seeing this thing. I would also argue, man of the sky, that, you know, maybe watching a first layer or two or three might solve this particular problem a little bit or at least mitigate the potential dangers that come along with this he's got a big machine i believe it's the 500 or it's a 450 it's a, it's one of the larger rat rig v core threes and i've always liked it because it appears like from everything that they talk about that the v core 4 solves a lot of the issues with the v core 3 but it does seem there are some issues with the documentation still but again i'd love to know I will be finishing up our Voron here, getting this thing running right. So if you do want to see that, let me know in those comments. And if you have any tips on what to do with our Voron Trident, I'd love to know because we're coming to the point where I really do want to get this machine running and getting it running right is a big, big deal to me. So if you are not a Voron Moron like I am myself, 
I'd love to get some assistance from you. Any help would be greatly appreciated because I'm still learning and that's a fun place to be. A little embarrassing as a content creator, but hey, speaking of embarrassing, I always like to embarrass our fans whose names listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher, but it's, it's always in a good way, right man of the sky? Do want to give a huge thank you to those individuals that help make these videos possible. And again, if you do want to support those efforts, you can do so by joining for as little as $1 a month via the links in that description down below. If you made it this far in the video, you will absolutely enjoy the rest of the Print Fix Friday series with now over 180 episodes for you to look at how we take a gander at print failures and how to fix them. And next to that will be our tour of Construct 3D, which... We had a lot of fun filming, and if you enjoy Jacob as our podcast co-host, you'll absolutely love it when he gives us a tour around how he and his family make the UK's fastest 3D printers. That's all we have for you all today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.